Well, first, thanks for the invitation to speak here today. Um, I was here last year. Uh, just a quick show of hands. How many people were here last year? So about half the room? Okay. Um, just a quick uh, little bit about myself. I uh, started studying sleep in 1986. Picked up an issue of National Geographic magazine. And the cover article was, Why We Sleep. So I read the article, it was quite fascinating, and I thought to myself, well, there has to be a job in there somewhere because everyone sleeps. And uh, the interesting part, though, is they had all these theories about sleep. You know, why do we sleep? To this day, we still really don't definitively know why we sleep. However, there's probably about 30 to 40 different theories, some of it about deep sleep and some of it about REM sleep. And we know that during sleep, particularly during deep sleep, we have an increase in growth hormone secretion, protein synthesis. And we know that during REM sleep, there's a memory consolidation. And we've proved that in both animal models and in human research, that if we deprive an organism of REM sleep, we interfere with their learning. So whatever the function of sleep is, we know that it has to do with some type of restoration. So generally speaking, people talk about uh, body restoration, primarily during deep sleep, and then cerebral brain restoration during REM sleep. Now, REM sleep is quite an interesting uh, phase. And, and when you talk to sleep researchers or sleep uh, clinicians, they'll often say, well, humans have three states of existence. Wakefulness, non-REM sleep, and REM sleep. And REM sleep is quite physiologically different. So generally speaking, we have an active brain and an inactive, paralyzed body. So if we look at newborn babies, we look at neonates, they'll have about 50% of their sleep being REM sleep. And by the time you reach adulthood, it's down to about 20 to 25% of the entire night. If we go back into premature babies, then we're talking about maybe 75% REM sleep when they're born prematurely. And um, there was a theory called the ontogenetic hypothesis back in the 60s, and, and they extrapolated that increase in REM sleep percentage into the, uh, in utero, into the womb, and they were thinking maybe even up to 100% or close to 100% of, of sleep at one point for, uh, for a, a baby in the womb is actually REM sleep. And so the ontogenetic hypothesis would theorize that it's a time to have endogenous neural stimulation when the organism cannot interact with the environment. So whatever the reason though we have sleep, it certainly serves a function. We exhaust ourselves during the daytime and Things are restored at night when we sleep. So I read this article in National Geographic, thought to myself, well, there's gotta be a job. And I started working at a hospital sleep disorders laboratory in 1989. And, and I moved, after I did my bachelor's, I moved to uh, Ottawa, which was kind of the capital of a lot of the sleep research. Uh, one of the most famous uh, sleep doctors in the world by the name of Dr. Roger Broughton. And he was in uh, the 1960s studying in uh, France and he kind of coined the term disorders of partial arousal, which today we know as parasomnias. So he had a, he had a laboratory at the Ottawa General Hospital. So I did some, uh, I studied there for a period of time. And he kind of cornered the market on narcolepsy. And this was a time in, in the late 80s when we were doing a lot of paper polysomnography. And I'll get into that a little bit later when I talk more about technology. So I found it really fascinating. And, and then I got registered as a sleep technologist. That's the uh, RPSGT, Registered Polysomnographic Technologist. So when I did that, I got registered in 1991 and I was the 604th person in the world to get that designation. And today there's about 20,000. So like yourselves, we've got to do CE credits and every five years we have to rewrite the examination and pass all that. So it's an ongoing process. And I did my PhD at Carleton University and I used to teach a course on uh, sleeping and dreaming. It was a third year undergrad course. And uh, it, was, it was quite uh, interesting. Sometimes I'd have some students from industrial design take the class as an elective. Um, and it was interesting. I used to make the students write term papers, which wasn't as common. Today, a lot of the exams are multiple choice. And it was quite interesting because some of the students would write about their own personal experiences and some of their own sleep disorders. So I really enjoyed the teaching aspect of, at university. What I didn't enjoy is having a big for grant money from the government. So in 1996, I, uh, I worked at the hospital for about seven years at the Royal Ottawa Hospital. And I was on the executive of the Canadian Sleep Society when Mir Krieger was the president. 
Some of you might recognize the name. He's the, the senior author of Principles and Practice of Sleep Disorders Medicine. He's the senior uh, editor of that, that textbook. And that's quite a tome. It's, it's about this thick and it has about 150 or so chapters and it's the definitive medical textbook on sleep disorders medicine today. So I was on the Canadian Sleep Society as a board executive member when he was the president of that academy in the early 90s. So by the mid 90s I became rather disillusioned with uh, academia and having to beg for money. So I went to work for a, a multi-billion dollar company called Nelcor Puritan Bennett and they more or less commercialized pulse oximetry. So they were known around the world uh, as Nelcor and then they purchased the CPAP company called uh, Puritan Bennett which was out of Lenexa, Kansas and then they purchased uh, a sleep company in Ottawa uh, called Sandman and back in 1991 uh, myself and uh, the founder, co-founder of Brabon, Don Bradley, we actually were the original creators of the Sandman PSG system which became the number one sleep lab PSG system in the, uh, in the 90s. And even today, to this day, it's still used at, uh, at Stanford University and is on the East Coast. It was used at Hackensack. So um, when I started with them in 1996, I worked with them for a couple of years. And then uh, the big company scene really wasn't for myself because, you know, when we're doing $2 billion a year in revenue, you only had so much influence uh, in, in the actual vision of the company and the product development. So in 1998, uh, Don Bradley and myself, we started Brabon. So that's, that's the name, uh, Bray Bond, Bradley, and then Bond is part of my last name. And E is, uh, stands for Ethel, which is kind of the mythical secretary we hope to hire one day when we have money. It's a running joke. And as I, I tell people, though, it's because if we didn't put the E, it would be Bra Bond. And Don doesn't like being called a Bra, even though he's a very supportive kind of guy. <laughs> so. So I've, I've uh, reviewed articles for, uh, for journals, for the journal Sleep, and uh, I've written articles and co-authored articles, and, and I've lectured on four continents around the world. And just as part of my disclosure, we do manufacture and sell wearable products, biosensors that are used in sleep labs and recorders and, and DentiTrack. I'm, I'm here to educate you and motivate you and hopefully activate you in certain directions. Um, but if you're interested in any of the other commercial stuff, there's people at our booth you can talk to. So I, I live in, uh, that's my house in the middle of a forest. And I travel around the world, as I mentioned earlier. Um, just a few weeks ago, I was in, I was in Taipei and, and the president of the Southeast Asian Sleep Society he actually knew of our company. He said, oh, I know your products. I, I was at Stanford studying there for a year and they use your products. I said, oh, that's, that's correct. And when I'm traveling in many parts of the world, I, I will you know, speak English and I'll meet the people and they'll say, oh, you're, you're American. I say, no, I'm, I'm actually I'm from North America, but I'm Canadian. And they would then start talking about the differences in that. And then I got tired of explaining it. So I would just tell them, look, the difference between a Canadian and an American is that a Canadian is an unarmed American with health care coverage. <laughs> so I can't use that too much anymore unless they change the Affordable Care Act. But um, that's basically where Ottawa is. It's close to Montreal, about two hours by car, and Toronto's here. So I generally have to connect through Toronto if I'm going anywhere. And uh, it's a pretty good hub. Um, so it's about, what, two and a half thousand miles, I guess, direct to, it's a diagonal across the across the continent. It's actually easier for me in many ways to go to Europe so I can just get a direct flight to, to London. Um, this is me in February dressed for the beach <laughs> and um, there's a close-up of me there. It was about minus 20 Fahrenheit when I when I took those photos and where I live the the government in their infinite wisdom introduced turkeys, wild turkeys and I mean they're quite large. The male can grow up to almost 20 pounds and they can be quite aggressive. One day I had 15 walking in my backyard and my cat, my, my little cat, was stalking these huge turkeys and I thought okay that's it, I'm going to have to get a new cat. But eight of them spotted him and just kind of stared him down and he froze and didn't move. But one day I was driving down the road and you know it's a country road so we're doing about 50 miles an hour and um, yeah, this, this turkey came across the road and, and, and it, I hit it with my car or just went over my car and, and I'm looking in the rearview mirror and it was tumbling and then splat hit the windshield in the car behind me. Next thing I know the, these cherry lights are going off, it's a police car and he's pulling me over. And, and then he walks up to me and asks for my you know, driver's license registration and I'm like, what, are you going to give me a ticket? 
He's like, yeah. I said, why are you giving me a ticket? He says, for flipping me the bird. <laughs> so that's a little bit about myself. Um, we're going to talk today about oral appliance therapy for obstructive sleep apnea, measuring compliance. I'm going to talk about technology, uh, custom oral devices for sleep apnea. Some of the objectives today, um, how does oral appliance therapy and CPAP work? And how do you know it's working? What kind of technology can we use to know if, if the therapy is actually working, both for CPAP and for oral appliance therapy? Uh, we're going to talk about compliance. Why measure it? And that's an exciting new frontier. I'm going to, talk, I'm going to tell you some stories today. We're going to have some fun. Um, I'm going to talk about test tree track, which is kind of my vision of how I like to do things when I'm working with people. And, and I don't see patients anymore, but I do have a lot of people that know me and they'll, they'll call me on the phone, business contacts, friends, family. So I do a lot, and I have sleep apnea. I tend to have mild, it's more UARS, but it depends if I gain or lose five to seven pounds. Depends if I'm drinking alcohol. A few weeks ago when I did a test on myself, I had an HI of 11.5. And then the previous week though, I was at six. And then sometimes I'm at two. It depends where exactly I'm going with my weight. We're going to talk a lot about technology and understanding what to use, when to use it, types of patients who may benefit from oral appliance compliance measurement. And then we're going to talk about evaluation of oral appliance success and compliance reporting. So a lot of this is, is new stuff you're not going to get anywhere else. Um, for those of you who are interested, we did write a, a Dental Sleep Medicine is a free app, a Dental Sleep Medicine Study Guide. It's on the Android Store and the Apple Store. Um, a lot of the people that have taken the uh, sleep credential exam at this academy and other academies have said they found this very useful. The price is right, it's free. So you can go there and take it. It's a 100 multiple choice questions. Now this is a poster I made. I was sitting in my uh, dentist's office one day in the hygienist chair and I was looking at this blank spot on the wall and I realized there's a perfect opportunity for both education and a little bit of marketing. So we made these free posters um, and it basically you've got a list of apnea symptoms here. You know, for example, ab fractions, narrow tongue, scalloping on the borders, morning headaches, your malin patty, neck size. And I wrote this with a friend who's uh, boarded in both otolaryngeology and, uh, and sleep medicine. He's dual boarded and he runs an adult outpatient sleep program in uh, South Bend, Indiana. So we sat down one day and, and kind of wrote this and nasal breathing improves snoring and sleep apnea and that's, you know, his thing is an ENT, he does a lot of septoplasties and nasal surgeries. Some of the symptoms here, uh, a lot of the dentists that have this, another friend of mine in Daniel Clower, Dr. Daniel Clower in South Bend, he has one of these in each of his uh, examination rooms and he'll see, he's told me that Patients will walk up to this and they'll just point to this last one, this last one, erectile dysfunction. He said they won't say it, but they'll all point to it and say, this last one here, is this, is this for real? And, and the point of this poster really is just to open up the conversation with your patients. So if you have a hygienist, um, you put this in the operatory, and uh, when they're looking in the mouth, they're looking at all this stuff anyway. And they can say, look, I'm, I'm, in, I'm looking in your mouth and I'm seeing scalloping on the borders of your tongue. You've got some ab fractions. You've got a high arch narrow palate. Uh, your mal and patty score is a three or four meeting. You've got a narrow airway. Do you wake up with morning headaches? Do you snore? And this opens up the conversation. So if you're interested in that, those are free. They're available. Uh, I think we have some at the booth. So just to get a feel for the room, how many of you today are, are actually actively making snoring and sleep apnea appliances? So about a little more than half, I'd say. And how many of you are using some type of technology to record at home to do follow-up baseline? Okay, probably about a third. So, um, so we're all on the same page. Much of what I'm going to talk about today goes across the sleep disorder spectrum. If you don't have this, I'll pass this around. These are laminated guides. And if you could just pass that around. And then what I'll do is, um, if you like to keep these, if you can learn the front and back of these, you can have an intelligent conversation with any sleep tech or sleep doctor anywhere in the world. So sometimes we'll get calls uh, from, from doctors and they'll say, oh, I want 15. And I'm like, 15? Why? They put one in every operatory and then one at the front desk. 
And the whole point is when they're talking to patients, they just grab this and say, um, this is what your airflow looks like, this is where you should be. And on the back, of course, it breaks down and explains AHI and RDI and so on and so forth. So two key questions for dental sleep medicine. How does oral appliance therapy work and how do you know that it's working for an apnea patient? And another one, how do you know if a patient is wearing their oral appliance therapy? So I'll talk about this a bit more later, but I always say there's two Achilles heels in oral appliance therapy. One is objective compliance measurement and the other is a priori knowing if the oral appliance is gonna work for patients. So we've chosen to focus right now on the uh, dental, on the compliance Achilles heel. And I follow a program called Test Treat Track. And so with testing, you can have any type of uh, home sleep recording device. Now, generally speaking, we, we want the recording device because we want to know a starting point. It's an objective starting point. Uh, a couple years ago, or a few years ago, I went to go buy a car and I'm talking to the salesman. And we're across the table and he's like, oh, what do you do? And oh, what I told him, oh, I'm doing with snoring and sleep apnea. And I looked at the guy and he's, he was Caucasian. And according to the research, you know, if you look at Caucasians versus Asians, for the same um, uh, apnea apnea index, Caucasians will have significantly higher BMI. So he had, he had a bit of a girth to him. And so I said, do you snore? He says, oh yeah, my wife says I do. And uh, I said, well, do you have any, any chips or you know, gaps in the bottom of your teeth called ab fractions? And he goes, oh, you mean these? I said, oh, yeah, you've got some ab fractions. And do you ever wake up with morning headaches? Oh, so, yeah, right back here. And show me your tongue. Oh, yeah, you got scalloping on your tongue. Oh, you got sleep apnea. You should get tested. So anyway, so he never came down $1,000. I ended up buying a different color, same car on the drive home. But he did email me, he took my advice, because I, I told him, I said, yeah, you're gonna make yourself feel 10 years younger. You should do something about that. So a few months later, he emailed me, and he took my advice, and he went to the local hospital, got tested, and he said they scared the crap out of him. And they put him on CPAP. So then a few months later, that was, I met him around October, and that was December when he got tested, and the following March, I called him, or emailed him again to follow up, just out of curiosity one night. And he said he could not tolerate the CPAP, but he went down three belt hole sizes. So he lost weight and he says completely changed his life and he feels like a new man. So my point is, before you even use any of this, you've already got a feeling for the patient. Now, how many people use a stop bang questionnaire? So it's really simple, right? STOP, snoring, do you snore? Are you tired during the day? Has anyone ever observed sleep apnea, the O? And P, do you have high blood pressure, STOP? Bang, body mass index, age over 50, neck circumference, right, more than 17 inches for men, 16 for women, and gender being male. So the men have already got one out of eight. So generally speaking, if you score four or higher, you're at high risk for sleep apnea. So these type of questionnaires are really good for sensitivity, but really bad for specificity. You could identify and screen people, but the specificity is really poor. It's usually a 50 or less. So before you're even doing any of this testing, you've got an idea for who you're talking to because this stuff does not happen in a vacuum. Right? You want to talk to the person, you want to look in their mouth, you want to get a feel for their habits. You know, usually you have some type of questionnaire up front. So that's the whole testing part. Once you, once you actually give them some type of technology to do the testing, then it comes back with an objective number. That's your starting point. Even if you get a referral from a sleep lab, that's, that's a good place to start because now you're gonna compare apples to apples. Once you get this and the patient comes back, so let's say their EHI is you know, 12, 16, and you've got some type of letter of authorization from a physician saying, yeah, go ahead and make this medical device for this patient. You make your oral appliance, and when I checked the FDA website yesterday, there's 153 different oral appliances cleared by the US FDA for the treatment of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. So then after that, we addressed that one Achilles heel I mentioned by creating a device to actually track compliance, to objectively track compliance. And I'm gonna talk more about that in detail. So that's basically a kind of a philosophy that I follow, test, treat, track, is this is where you're gonna measure your outcomes both with this and with this. So I'm gonna to talk to you about change. Much of what I'm telling you today is all about change. 
change is very difficult for a lot of people. And what's really interesting is it's omnipresent, it's difficult, and the technology is always changing around us. So if I was to say to you today, what was life like in the year 1900? And what was the environmental crisis of the day in 1900? Here's a photo of Market Street, San Francisco, before the big earthquake, April 14th. So this is about 111 years ago, roughly. And this is, a, you can watch videos of this online where they're going down the cable car down San Francisco. So the environmental crisis of 1900, when they had their first urban meetings. And much of what I'm telling you is from uh, the author, Michael Crichton. A really smart guy, he gave a lecture at uh, Caltech in 2003, he's dead now. Horse manure. <laughs> Horse manure was the environmental crisis of the day. And what was the, what was the green solution? What was the green environmental solution of the day to, to address horse manure? <laughs> you got to remember the manure was piling up two to three stories. In downtown Boston, Chicago, New York, there were maggots and flies in the heat of the summer, rats running rampant. The first urban conference talked about how within so many decades we're going to be overrun. All these climate alarmists were going nuts. Kind of sounds familiar, right? <laughs> the automobile was the green environmental solution of the day back in the year 1900. So if I ask you to close your eyes for 10 seconds and just think, what's it going to be like, what will life be like in the year 2100? So just close your eyes for 10 seconds. Think about that. Do you know? Does anybody know? Do we, any of us really know? So if I said this question to a person in the year 1900, and I said, what's, what's it going to be like? What will life be like here in the year 2000? Well, let's take a look at what we have in the year 2000, the airplane. Well, the airplane wasn't invented until 1903, right? So that, they didn't even know about that. Satellites, no. Intercontinental ballistic missiles, weapons of mass destruction, CD-ROM, USB, computer, Wi-Fi, cellular, X-ray, atom theory. Well, the atom theory wasn't even invented yet. So if you're going to tell somebody in the year 1900 that in the year 2000, 80% of electricity generated in France comes from nuclear power using a theory, the atom theory, that isn't even invented yet, they're not going to know any of this. CPU, MRI, CBCT, cone beam, internet, transistor, email, none of this will make any, even the FDA, God bless them, didn't exist back then. So change is profound. It's always around us. I can't predict the future, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is going to be change. I'm going to tell you the OSA will not go away. If we look at the predictions from the Center for Disease Control, it's going to become more rampant. They're predicting that by the year 2030, 42% of the general population in the U.S. will have a BMI over 30. So 42% will be obese versus about 30% in the year 2012. Oral appliances will become more popular. I will bet on that. In some countries in Europe, for example, in the Netherlands and Belgium, the dominant method for treating obstructive sleep apnea is oral appliance therapy. It actually has more market share than CPAP. That's because it's funded by the public government. So when you have a payer system conducive to oral appliance therapy, and you have a system that works for it, you can have a much larger share of the market. So we're going to talk about technology we use. Generally speaking, there's four types. There's two scales that people will use, you'll encounter in the literature. This goes back to the 90s from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Sleep laboratory, type one or level one. It used to be 16 channels or more, but now you'll see some labs will have 40 something channels. Same technology can be used, but it's in the home with no sleep technologist. That's a type two. So you're generally looking at electrophysiology and a whole bunch of cardiopulmonary measures in both. You still have more channels here, but the important thing is you have a sleep technologist in attendance. Type 3 is just cardiopulmonary, but a type 3 would have a minimum of uh, blood oxygenation, pulse rate or EKG, airflow and ventilatory effort. And then type 4 would be your pulse oximeter. And sometimes when I was the product manager for a product called OxyFlow, back in 1996-97, it was a pulse oximeter with an airflow channel. 
And you can use a pulse oximeter, but you have to understand that your, your specificity is going to be greatly reduced, right? Because you're not going to be measuring flow limitations, so you can't look for UARS. And if you have a menopausal patient, you need to, be, you know, you need to keep that in mind. And also, you're not going to be measuring ventilatory efforts. You can't look at central versus obstructive apnea. Now, more recently, in 2011, Dr. Collip, who was a past president of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, she uh, was the senior author on this article, which, which had a scale called the Scooper Scale. And so that uses sleep, cardiovascular, oximetry, position, effort, and respiratory. So the Scooper Scale has all sorts of divisions, and it's a more sophisticated method to actually identify the technology that people are using. So your product could be a Cooper or it could be a Scooper. It, you have to go product by product. By the way, if there's any questions as we're going along, just raise your hand. I'd like to make this interactive as we go. So a polysomnogram, right? It's a Greek-Latin hybrid multiple sleep recording. PSG, you'll sometimes hear it called full PSG or full poly. This is the machine that I first started on. Um, this is around 1989. They weighed well over 200 pounds. It's over six feet high. These are all banks of amplifiers. And as a technologist, you could adjust the high pass and low pass filter. The high frequency and low frequency filters can be adjusted. And this is an electrode selector panel. So I could choose which electrodes that are on the human body to connect them into this amplifier system. And here we had paper that was stored here and it came up through this pen system. There's ink and pens right here. And then the paper would fold over here and make a mess. So the technologist would have to watch. And it was fan fold paper. And if I grabbed the paper and walked, I could walk for a quarter mile. And that was one long medical test. And we had to keep each uh, recording for about seven years, because it was a medical study. It was medical recording. So that caused to us to have storage issues. And that caused us then the storage became fire issues, because the paper gets dry over seven years. So eventually, what happened was we ended up going with uh, digital polysomnography. In the early 90s, you know how every market goes into early adopter, growth, maturity, and decline. When we started the Sandman system in the early 90s, it hit that sweet spot in growth, right at the point where the paper polysomnography was being changed to paperless. And um, that was really when you saw an explosive growth in both sleep laboratories and digital paperless polysomnography. So, in 2003, we received FDA clearance on this product, and it measures just under five inches by just under three by less than an inch thick. And it was actually an entire sleep lab in the palm of your hand. And people are still using it today around the world, but we were too far ahead of the market. You don't, you don't want to be too far ahead of the market. You, 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 we were probably you know six feet ahead of the market. We should have been six inches ahead, because we were doing stuff back then that people didn't believe. Had we made it the size of a large phone book, it probably would have been much more successful. But people looked at it and didn't believe it could do what it did and just said, oh, it's a pulse oximeter. It's like, no, it's a lot more than that. And then we ended up having to explain to them how advanced it was. So if we released that product today, it would probably be a lot more successful. But like I said, we still have people using it. And this is what you're going to look like. How many people have slept in a sleep lab? So probably maybe a tenth of the people in the room or less, 10% or less. So basically, in a sleep lab, you, you go there, and what happens is uh, the technologist would abrade the surface skin, because your surface epidermis is an insulative barrier. And so they use a little abrasive substance. And then they uh, apply an electrode with a conductive salt bridge, like an electroconductive paste. And they put electrodes on different parts of your body. So on the chest for EKG, on legs, on the interior tibialis of your legs, to measure leg movements, sometimes on the brachial radialis to measure arm movements uh, for tremors. And then we put some maybe on the masseter, the zygomatic arch. We often put them on the chin for uh, submental EMG for looking for the drop off in, in body paralysis, body and muscle tone during REM sleep. And then we'll put them on the scalp for EEG and on the eyes for EOG. So then we put on some belts. Uh, here for ventilatory effort and a pulse oximeter, and then sometimes a body position sensor. Other labs will put more electrodes on, or they'll put end tidal CO2 or TC CO2, which is transcutaneous. 
Though it, and it varies from lab to lab, right? And every lab thinks they're better than the other lab, and every lab wants a custom report. So no two labs have the same necessary protocol. And fundamentally, yes, the technology is the same, but there's always a lot of variation. So then you have the patient come in, and, and they're in a strange environment, in a strange bed, with a stranger watching them on an infrared camera, and you've got them all hooked up, and you say, okay, now I want you to sleep like you do at home. And so a lot of people can't. A lot of people wake up in the morning and say, oh, I didn't sleep a wink. Polygraphically, yes, they have sleep, but the perception of sleep versus the electrographic recording of sleep often do not correlate well. So that's, that's a, there's actually a sleep disorder called sleep state misperception based on that. So this is what we end up with. We end up with a type one recording with brain waves and you have uh, eye movements, muscle tone. This is about five minutes right here of the entire night. So this is only a five minute snapshot of raw data corresponding to the entire night. And then down here we have our cardiopulmonary measures, right? You're looking at the legs and airflow. And here you'll have pressure airflow with continued ventilatory effort, followed by a desaturation. We have some recovery effort here, and then a cycle repeats itself. And here it says supine, supine. So the patient's on the back, and you can confirm this on the video. And what we have here is the whole night down here on this block. And we can see then that the patient, when they're on their back, has desaturations. They have obstructive sleep apnea. Over here, it's the same thing. And over here, it's the same thing. So here, what we have is classic uh, positional sleep apnea. Now, what's interesting is this part here, this little break in the data, that's just when the patient went to the washroom. And I was there all night long and because um, I was observing. So what was uh, interesting is that this patient actually said to the tech, to the sleep technologist, um, can I, what position do you want me to sleep in? And she said, you can sleep in any position. And he said, well, I don't sleep on my back. My wife won't let me. And then she said, I quote, I want you to sleep on your back. And so that's what you see here is confirmation of positional apnea. So he probably ended up on a CPAP. What was it? Well, they did actually do a CPAP later on, but what was interesting is she had an interesting method of ensuring compliance. One time uh, when I was there, one of the patients in the three rooms was whining about the CPAP mask, and her method was quite interesting. She said, you shut your bleep mouth, and you put that bleep thing on your face and go to sleep. And that was how she got him to comply with CPAP therapy. <laughs> Whatever works. So with in-lab PSG or type 1, we can evaluate virtually all sleep disorders. All right? The, they're all different tools. Whether you're using a home sleep recording device or a sleep, lab, a piece, uh, sleep laboratory technology or a pulse oximeter, they're all different tools. There's about 90 different sleep disorders. So if you go to a sleep laboratory, they can look at virtually everything. Some labs are better at some things than others. For example, if you're going to do pediatric sleep apnea, you're better off with a pediatric facility. Right? Some other labs might have a specialist who's a neurologist, specializes in narcolepsy or REM behavior disorder. Most labs, what they're doing, probably over 90% of what they do is sleep, obstructive sleep apnea. It's the most common. MSLT and MWT, multiple sleep latency test and maintenance of wakefulness test. So these are two terms you should know when you're talking to physicians and sleep technologists. The multiple sleep latency test is basically five naps during the day up to five. Usually if you don't fall asleep by four, they don't do the fifth. But these are naps that are generally 10 to 20 minutes in duration. And you're, you're putting the patient into a room and you're turning out the lights and you're saying, okay, I want you to relax, close your eyes and try to go to sleep. So the instruction is important. You're measuring how quickly can someone fall asleep. So you have, if you have someone with uh, hypersomnolence, excessive daytime sleepiness, like a narcoleptic, then an MSLT test is valuable because you can look at how quickly they fall asleep and you can also determine whether or not they have sleep onset REM periods, which are one of the characteristics of having narcolepsy. Now the maintenance of wakefulness test, you have the patient sitting reclined in a comfortable chair like a lazy boy and you have them keep their eyes awake and you dim down the lights and you say, okay, now I want you to relax and try to stay awake. So the internal validity, the internal validity here is you're measuring the attempt the capability of the person to try to stay awake. So if you're looking at a truck driver, an airline pilot, train engineer, your, MSL, your MSLT is not really the best test. Your MWT would be better. If you're looking at a narcoleptic or someone with excessive daytime sleepiness, your MSLT would be better. 
And those are tests that the, you would do in a sleep laboratory. But when you're talking to sleep techs and sleep physicians, they're going to come back to you and, all, and they're going to say, PSG is a gold standard. You, you hear that all the time, right? So what I'm going to counter is, is a difference and I'm going to say, well, not really. PSG is not a gold standard because there is no, it's never been validated against anything other than itself, number one. Number two, there's no anatomical or biological gold standard for obstructive sleep apnea. So if you have, if you're doing a CBTT scan and you suspect there's something on there that might indicate you're a little suspicious, you think, oh, it might be cancer, you're going to send the patient and the info to the radiologist, get an interpretation. And they're going to say, you know what, maybe there is something there, let's do a biopsy. They take the biopsy, they send it to a lab, now they've got an anatomical marker, they're looking at it very closely, now they've got a gold standard with which to compare it and say, yes, that's an abnormal cell. So with PSG, we can't do that. So it's not really a true gold standard in the sense. It hasn't been validated against anything else other than itself. But it's the best we have. In the 1970s, when they first started measuring all sorts of sleep disorders, they just started with everything under the sun. We'll start measuring all this stuff. But there's lots of research that's out there saying you do not need to record EEG to diagnose sleep apnea. It's not a requisite. It goes back to the 19, goes back 20, 30 years. There's lots of studies out there. It just depends how you use the tool. If the test comes back negative for sleep apnea, of course, then you've got to do a more sophisticated test if the clinical indications suggest it, because none of this happens in a vacuum. So home sleep apnea testing, H HSAT, you can be either type two or type three. So changes in technology, by the year 2006, now we're a quarter of a pound or less, much smaller. We can put electrodes on the face if you want to record EEG, here you have a K complex and here you have a sleep spindle. Unambiguous stage REM sleep, so EEG, EOG, EMG, and here you can see the difference in brain waves, K complex, sleep spindle, deep sleep, REM sleep with rapid eye movements here, lower muscle tone, wakefulness, low voltage desynchronized EEG, stage one sleep where you have low voltage, desynchronized EEG with a little less muscle tone than during stage wake. So all of this can be still done in the home, but whether it's in a lab or the home, we can break down the sleep into different stages, and we can plot it on a histogram, and we know exactly what's going on in terms of the depth of sleep, right? Deep sleep. We know the brain waves during deep sleep are different than during wakefulness, and REM sleep is often plotted closer to stage one. So these dark splotches are REM sleep. In the animal literature, you'll often hear it called paradoxical sleep because it was considered a paradox that for the animals, they would be, the brain waves would look like they're awake, but in fact, they're asleep in REM sleep. So um, sleep researchers would often use cats for as the, as the animal model back in the 60s and 70s because they would sleep on average of something like 14.6 hours a day. So they were, they were the prefer and they were small and docile and they had a developed neocortex. So they were great animals to work with. So we can do all sorts of different tests. So if you have a patient that comes in complaining of, of bruxing or you suspect bruxism based on looking in their mouth, you can do EMG electrodes. And we work with Dr. Gilles Levine, who's the Dean of Dentistry at the University of Montreal. And he recommended temporalis, zygomatic arch, masseter muscles, and we'll, we'll do that for measuring bruxism. But if the patient's bed partner is complaining of snoring, then you could focus in on the snoring. If you're doing CPAP, you could focus in on measuring with CPAP, and I'll talk a bit about that later. So you can tailor the tool and use it accordingly to what you want to look at and, and hone in on, on, on the clinical symptoms. And you can simultaneously record all sorts of electrophysiology, snoring, uh, ventilatory effort, airflow. You can look at flow limitation. You can look at blood oxygenation, body position, and photoplethysmography. And we can simplify it further. In 2008, we made a device which looks the same, but it had less stuff in it. And there's less stuff on the screen compared to the earlier uh, raw data I showed you. And you'll notice there's less, the same signals being collected, just less of them. Because now we're really looking at sleep apnea. It's the same with pulse oximetry. Here we have overnight pulse oximetry, 
and this is just a wrist pulse ox, and that would be a type four. Sometimes people would add like an airflow measurement to that. And of course, there's less stuff on the screen. And you can simultaneously record, if you have an, a measure of airflow, you could record snoring, airflow, flow limitation, pulse oximetry, and PPG. Now in 2015, we actually got FDA clearance for uh, this device. We call it DentiTrack, and now the weight is down into single digit grams. And the, me the size is now measured in millimeters, no longer measured in inches or feet. This is the actual raw data, it doesn't mean much to you. We'll talk more about that later. And you can record oral temperature, head position, time, and it has anti-deception algorithms. So what do all of these devices have in common? Right? They're all recorders. And this is how technology has changed in the last 25 years from paper, machines that were measured in hundreds of pounds, to small handheld devices that did the same, in fact more, to smaller devices still, and then even smaller devices now we have, they're all, you know, most of the new stuff is all wearable tech. And, and this is certainly a wearable tech here, and it's worn inside the body. So we were the first in the world to get that through the FDA as a wearable tech inside the body. And um, there's been a lot of um, need for that that I'm gonna talk to you about momentarily. So what do we do with all of this information? Well, we're really focused in on sleep disorder breathing because it's, like I said earlier, about 90% of what the sleep labs are doing. Apnea hypopnea index is often a focus, right? Why? Because the insurance companies will pay based on the AHI. I've had friends who have approached me and said, well, I, I did the test like you said, and a friend in California, and the, and the insurance company wouldn't pay because his AHI was 12. And I said, well, hang on a second, this is what you need to do. You need to, you need to go back to them and tell them that you've got this comorbidity, that comorbidity, you've got hypertension, you're at risk for this, at risk for stroke, and he did that, then they did pay after that. Because the insurance companies know that if they can prevent one stroke or heart attack today, they're gonna save that money tenfold over the next quarter, the next four quarters. Uh, there are other measures, and it's quite a controversy. A lot of physicians would rather talk about arousals, respiratory disturbance index, flow limitation, RERAs, right? Respiratory effort related arousals, pulse rate variability. But AHI really is still the prime number that most people focus in on. But the goal ultimately is successful treatment, right? Oral appliance therapy or CPAP. That's our ultimate goal, successful treatment. So let's talk a little bit about CPAP. How does it work? CPAP machine blows room air into the upper airway to prevent it from collapse. The interface covers the nose. Now a lot of the sleep technologists today will also use full face masks where it covers nose and mouth simultaneously. The problem with the full face mask is you now cause a diffusion in the pressure, right? This diffused pressure now requires a higher pressure setting for the same therapeutic level and that's based on published research. A friend of mine who's a manager of a sleep lab and he's both a registered sleep technologist and a respiratory therapist calls them lazy sleep technologists. Instead of taking the time to find the mask that best fits that individual patient, they'll just throw a full face mask covering nose and mouth simultaneously. But you, as you know, you should not be breathing through your mouth. All right, have any, any orthodontists in the room? Okay, so you know all about mouth breathing in children. You want to expand them, you want to open up the base of the nose, the roof of the mouth, and once you turn them from an obligatory mouth breather to a nose breather, you're gonna see profound improvements. You want to breathe through the nose. That poster I mentioned earlier from the ENT, nasal breathing is the most important part of breathing, most important route. You're introducing nitric oxide into the system. It's like, it's a, it's a, a vascular dilator. Think of CPAP as an air splint. Right? It is effective, but it's usually low compliance, and we're gonna talk more about that. These are three generations of CPAP devices. This is an older one, they're not, they're not made anymore. These ones are primarily phased out. This is a beautiful looking, I mean, they've evolved over the years to looking like a medical device to a clock radio. This is something you can put next to your bed, and many people would think that's your clock radio. 
This looks like a beautiful Bang & Olufsen stereo equipment. I mean, they've put a lot of money into industrial design. That's my point. They put a lot of money into sophisticated algorithms to detect apneas and, and snoring and central apneas and so on. And they put money into pressure transducers and heated hoses and warm passover humidifiers. So a lot of money has been invested. And they'll have whole entire teams of 20 or 30 engineers working on this one product. So this is the newer generation of products. And they will have uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cellular, and they'll measure compliance and HI and upload all that every day. And, and AT&T or Verizon or whoever is their partner will get that and bada boom, bada bing, it's there. It's right, you know, instantaneous. The blower size, the new trend now is smaller travel pap, if you will, smaller size blowers, smaller size machines, but it's not just a machine. In fact, a few years ago, there was a company out of Singapore that invented a wearable CPAP. You could wear it on your head, but it wasn't, uh, the market uptake wasn't as strong as I believe they were hoping. But the problem though is when you travel, the hose is still almost six feet long, more or less. So you still gotta coil up that hose, you still gotta carry your mask, you still have to carry the blower, and then there's often the AC, DC power supply, right? There's the power, and all of that has to go into the equivalent of like a backpack. So it's still inconvenient, whereas with an oral appliance, I have it in my pocket, I can pull it out, I don't need electricity, I can wear it on an airplane. In fact, when I travel, I always carry my oral appliance on the plane with me. So the blowers are getting smaller. The mask interfaces, however, remain the largest issue for most people. And even one of my employees recently, she got put on CPAP and she had mask issues. And so what I instructed her, she was gonna go on vacation without her CPAP and I said, hang on, don't do that. That's a prescription device, you're sick. Uh, go get an app. And so she downloaded an app, you know, to record snoring at night. They're not medical devices, but it's more for health and fitness. She did that, and we listened to it together the next day, and it was probably the most disturbing sound I had ever heard so far in my career of, of working with people. And it was like listening to somebody gasping through a straw. <coughs> so when she heard it herself, she also understood the severity of it. She went and followed up with the respiratory therapist at the Durable Medical Equipment Company, they got her a new mask that was more comfortable and now she's wearing her CPAP and when she went on vacation in Mexico, she took it with her. So you need to make sure you're, even if your patients are on CPAP, you're having these conversations with them. So oral appliance therapy, just a real high level view of how it works. We've got an intraoral device placed in the mouth, holds the mandible and or tongue forward. You usually have an increased vertical opening. It acts as a mechanical splint to increase airway space so your airway doesn't collapse usually as much, and I'll talk more about that when you breathe in. The two most common types, TRDs and MRDs. So usually the mechanism of action is, is limited to the velopharynx, oropharynx areas. Uh, when you're talking about CPAP, you wanna make sure you've got a, even oral appliance, you wanna make sure you've got nasopharyngeal patency is good. If not, a referral to an ENT for a septoplasty or, or some other procedure. And of course, oral appliances will not work down in the hypopharynx area. But a CPAP, when you have a patent nasal airway, it's kind of like going hunting with a shotgun. It just blows room air in there, and you're naturally going to be increasing the blood oxygenation of the body. Oral appliances are, we know from the literature that custom is usually better than a boil and bite. Titratable is usually better than a non-titratable. And then the bite registration, that's another interesting area. Uh, I was talking to Dr. John Viviano out of Toronto recently and um, he was working on publishing a paper that compared the phonetic bite registration. For those of you who know Dr. Stephen Olmos from San Diego, he's been a big proponent of the phonetic or sylvan phoneme bite. And in the research they found that there was no, they're hoping to publish this, but they found no real difference. Uh, but they did find that the phonetic bite seems to get you to the end point faster. So that was really interesting in and of itself. So I'm hoping to hear more about that. So here's a, a scan of myself with my oral appliance. I gave myself permission to show these publicly. 86% increase in interior posterior area. So you see the increase here in the area, the dimensions. This is an interesting article. This is a, a kind of a figure from the article from Chan and Sestouli from 2009. What's really interesting in this, and this is published in the medical literature, and uh, Dr. Peter Sestouli out of Australia is quite a, a proponent of oral appliance, an expert in oral appliances. 
And in this article, the solid line represents oral appliances and the dash line represents CPAP. And, and what they make here is the case that in terms of affordability, they're about the same. In terms of convenience, however, oral appliances are much more convenient than CPAP. We talked about that. Patient and partner acceptance, much higher with oral appliances. When I share a hotel room with uh, the manager of the sleep lab, he, years ago I told him, hey Mark, you gotta test yourself because you're, you're gurgling at night and you've got all sorts of weird noises going on. Sure enough, he had sleep apnea. And what I found though is even though I'm in a separate bed and I'm a few feet away, he'll roll over in the middle of the night, the CPAP mask will leak and air will blow and it's disturbing my sleep. So there's no surprise that patient and bed partner acceptance is better with an oral appliance. And tolerance of the oral appliance is much better. And adherence, we're gonna talk more about that. Compliance or adherence is much better with, with oral appliance therapy. The health benefits, this is surprising. The health benefits are about the same. Symptom control is about the same. And the only measure where CPAP consistently outperforms oral appliance therapy is on your polysomnographic measures. All those tools we talked about earlier. Using any of those tools, you'll always find the CPAP will give you a better AHI than an oral appliance. What's the average AHI with CPAP? It depends on the physician. Sometimes the average AHI with, with CPAP, that's the question. Some physicians want it to go down to 0.0, .0 which to me is unrealistic, and you'll often see their patients coming from their labs with a high pressure setting, but you often want to get it down below 5. That's your goal, because generally below five is considered within normal limits. Beg your pardon? That's across the board? That's the goal. I know they want that, but what's the average? Well, the average, there isn't going to be like an average where you're going to have uh, overall, because there's going to be a lot of variability. It depends on, on the technologist who's actually performing, because what happens in the traditional paradigm is the technologist is in the sleep lab and they're, and they're adjusting the pressure setting or titrating it in the sleep laboratory. And it depends on the protocol that they have. But typically your protocol should be below five AHI, so less than five apneas per hour of sleep. If they have a different protocol, that might be towards zero. Obviously you want to get it as low as possible, but the lower you go, the higher the pressure generally. The mean O2 is gonna vary from patient to patient. Is there another question? Right, and your variability is still going to vary quite a bit. Well, it's very hard in the literature to find out the AHI that come with the CPAP. It's also hard to find out. I think you're looking for a unicorn. <laughs> so here's a question that you're often going to see. Are you better off using something that works really well? By working really well, I mean it lowers your AHI almost consistently to the goal, whatever that goal is, whether it's less than five or zero. Or, and this is CPAP with an AHI or PSG measures, but you use it less, or are you better off using something that doesn't quite work as well, an oral appliance, but you're using it more? Mm -hmm. So here's a very uh, well, well, this is probably the, this is called the Blue Journal, right? The American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine. It's in the medical literature, 2013. I gave a talk at the annual sleep conference. Dr. Phillips was on stage with myself and then Dr. Remmers. And uh, we spoke about, he spoke about this study and uh, they measured cardiovascular uh, parameters, 24-hour blood pressure, arterial stiffness, subjective sleepiness, the FOSS questionnaire. They randomly assigned 126 patients, 108 finished the study, but these people had moderate to severe OSA. What they found is that CPAP reduced AHI better, but moderate to severe OSA patients were similar after treatment with CPAP and oral appliance therapy. 
In other words, no difference between the therapy modalities. Because patients wear oral appliances more than they wear CPAP. Long-term studies, they say, need objective measurement, and we'll talk a bit more about that. So why did Phillips find this? Why did he say that? What, and this is now called mean disease alleviation, and I'm going to get into that in more detail later with some European research. So basically, the two most common treatment modalities, CPAP and oral appliance therapy. Now, I didn't mention the implantable pacemaker. That was FDA cleared a couple years ago, so that's being introduced and rolled out across the U.S., generally considered for moderate to severe sleep apnea. Um, but that's on a limited introduction right now. And that is limited to also otolaryngologists, ENT surgeons, to do that as an implantable pacemaker for sleep apnea. So that's going to be a new uh, medical device option that's becoming increasingly available. So how do we know if CPAP treatment is working for the patient? So this is my mom. And years ago, I told her she had uh, obstructive sleep apnea, right? But she wouldn't listen to me. And then she had a heart attack and then a transient ischemic attack. I used to hear her snoring with the doors closed upstairs through the floor. But again, you can only bring a horse to water, right? So then the nurse practitioner said, you need to go to the hospital sleep lab for an overnight sleep test. And she said, no, that's OK. My, my son happens to know a little bit about sleep, right? So, OK, I got a PhD. I'm a registered sleep tech. I've been doing this for 30 years. And I had to drive now 300 miles for a house call. And I, I brought my CPAP down. I don't, I'm not a physician, so I can't prescribe CPAP. But this is my mom we're talking about. So I brought my Metabyte. We did a test. Sure enough, 44 was her AHI. She had 297 DSATs of 3% or more. She had 10.5% uh, of, her, of her time during the night of uh, SpO2 value, blood oxygenation between 80 and 89%, which was almost 50 minutes. And uh, this was her baseline snoring. There's no real difference between supine and non-supine AHI. Snoring volume is loud. This is 100 dB up here, 40. And I did this last summer. Um, you can see the SpO2 going up and down, quite a bit of pulse rate variability. And um, then the next night, Saturday night, I did the repeat of the test with uh, an auto pap. And uh, we got our AHI down to 6.8. So I just set the pressure between 8 and 12 and woke up the next day, downloaded the data. So we went from almost 300 down to less than 50 DSATs. And down there, remember this was at, uh, that was where were we before. We were at 10.5% uh, of the night now, or less than 1%. And her uh, heart rate, though, as uh, variability went down a bit. So this was a big improvement. And if we look at the snoring volume, it's gone. The SpO2 is now more constant during the night and shows she's wearing it. What's interesting, though, is now 98% of the night was supine. So this is how we know if CPAP is, is working for somebody. This is done in a home environment, in a sleep lab. They'll often do split nights, although even that's controversial between the purists who believe in a full night baseline and then a full night CPAP. So there's different ways of the practitioners doing that. Um, this is a CPAP report, and I know now the pressure between 8, 9, and 10 centimeters of water, and I can tell the lowest SpO2 was 86 at 8, 90 at 9 centimeters of water, 91 at 10. So now, um, now I'm trying to just monitor her. Every time I talk to her, I say, are you wearing it? Right? Compliance is an issue now. So how do we know if oral appliance therapy is working for the patient? So here's a quick clinical, clinical flow chart. You're doing your comprehensive intake. You get a baseline test. Moderates and severe apneics to the sleep lab. Milds to moderates are suitable with a physician's letter of uh, medical necessity for oral appliance therapy. And then you fit and make your oral appliance and then repeat your test. So when we do testing, we can see baseline versus next night. We get some dramatic improvements. And this case here was CPAP on night one with no CPAP the next night. So here's an interesting case. I had a, a dentist contact me recently and said, hey, the HI actually went up, but the patient's feeling great. Now, well, I took a closer look. I said, well, if you look on their baseline, almost 26% of the night had a pulse rate between 75 and 100. But here, we're down to 5%. So here, 74% of the night had a pulse rate between 50 and 75, and now we're up 95%. So the minimum pulse rate here was 61. Here was 56. The average here is 72. The average here is 65. The maximum here is 104, which is tachycardia. 
and now the maximum with the oral appliance is 84. So I said to him, I think we're just not capturing the arousals and the pulse rate variability and the autonomic nervous system arousals. And I did notice that the patient still had some AHI that was uh, uh, more significant when supine. So I said, well, why don't you combine your behavioral treatment for, for controlling position, keep her off her back, and combine that with oral appliance therapy, you'll even get further improvements, and then repeat the test. And then if you still are concerned, then refer them back to the physician later. So you have to, my point is you have to look very closely, because when you're looking at pulse rate variability, you can see a change from 60 to 120. So you went from borderline bradycardia up to tachycardia within the span of seconds. And this is an arousal, except we're just not measuring the electrocortical stuff. We're not measuring the EEG. And then, of course, anytime you've got the AHI more than double in the supine position, more than double non-supine, you've got to keep in mind combining positional therapy with oral appliance therapy, because that can be a real powerful combination. So we know that oral appliances can work because we can look at baseline and follow-up. And this was a, a weekend course we did years ago, and the dentist walked up to me Sunday morning, so this is Friday night, Saturday night, and he said, how did I do last night? I said, I don't know, I haven't looked at the data. And he said, I feel great today. So when we looked at it, we found out that he was actually just less than four from moderate sleep apnea to more or less within normal limits. And he said, you know, I was diagnosed with, I'm being treated for depression. And I think it destroyed my marriage, because I was divorced last year. But really, I think what I have is undiagnosed sleep apnea. And you'll hear that a lot when you start uh, getting into this more and more. So this was a, a patient uh, that we, was a father-in-law of one of my employees, and we did a baseline test. He was CPAP non-compliant. The sleep lab said he was at 33. We did the test, confirmed he was at 38. We made a temporary appliance. He was a positive responder. So I said, when you go back to Florida, go see your dentist and get a proper permanent appliance made. This is a profound improvement from 72 down to 6. You can see the dramatic drop in snoring, dramatic improvement in SpO2 from all these desaturations to this more or less flat line here, just a little bit here. Another dentist, we went from 33 here on the baseline down to 3 with a temporary appliance. So you can use this technology to measure your baseline and your follow-up to determine success. So whether it's on CPAP or oral appliance therapy. So now let's talk about how do you know if people are actually adhering, adhering to therapy. So I will call it compliance. The politically correct term I am told is adherence. I, I'm not really into the political correctness scene. So you can think of adherence if I say compliance or you can call it cooperation or wherever you like. Yes? What type of temporary appliance were you using in the previous cases? Uh, a device that was designed by Dr. Jameson Spencer. He was a past president of the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain. And um, it, it, we call it the snore bite, but it's just like a tray that you can inject uh, polyvinyl siloxane, like mucoprin or GC Reline. And the, the, the time is about, say, five minutes to chair side time, literally maybe 10 minutes and it's FDA cleared for 30 days as a temporary. The advantage is that it gives you a kind of three-dimensional rotation because it's rather forgiving, so you're unlikely to induce any TMJ pain because it's, it's quite flexible. But I've always found it useful as an inexpensive method to identify res positive responders versus negative responders before, because you always have patients that don't want to pay the full price, right? So let's talk now about compliance. So what is compliance? The extent to which a person's behavior, taking medications, following a diet, whatever the recommendation is from the clinician, coincides with medical or health advice, right? So adherence, concordance, cooperation, some people prefer those terms because they're not considered passive, they're more active. For dental sleep medicine, orthodontics, the extent to which a person is using prescribed therapy. So my son was given a Schwartz palatal expander and I actually had uh, put a, a compliance recorder inside there and I used to track every day whether he was wearing it or not and it was quite interesting. He would come home from school, take it out when he was eating a snack after school, wouldn't put it back in until sleep. So he was only averaging 13 hours a day instead of the 22 prescribed. However, we still managed to get five millimeters expansion and uh, that's because he wore it during sleep. And he also anecdotally told me he felt it helped him breathe better. So it was interesting. 
Sometimes, though, we need to comply with the law. So, hello, this is the sheriff's office. What can I do for you? I'm calling about my neighbor, Virgil Smith. He's hiding marijuana in his firewood. I don't know how he gets it in those logs, but he hides it really well. Thank you very much for the call, sir. So the next day, the sheriff's deputies descend on Virgil's house, and they search the barn where the firewood is kept. The police go in with axes, and they're chopping up everything, but they don't find any marijuana. They find only firewood and barn stuff. And the sheriff's deputies sneer at Virgil, and then they leave. And shortly afterwards, Virgil's phone rings. He says, hey, Virgil, this year's Floyd. Did the sheriff come? He said, yeah. Did they chop all your firewood for the winter? He said, yep. He goes, happy birthday, buddy. <laughs> so when we're talking about compliance, we, we generally can talk about two measures, right? Direct or indirect. When we're talking about direct, we have physiological measures like airflow, body temperature. They're less subjective to bias, and this is where CPAP has been for years. You will not find any CPAP device, the blower, the, you know, the bedside machine, on the market today that does not have an objective measure of compliance. It's actually a requirement from insurance companies today to have a measure of compliance, because that's how they reimburse now for CPAP. The indirect measures are more self-reports, and they're frequently used. They're easier, of course, paper and pencil, logs. The more subject to bias, and this is where oral appliance has been. Oral appliance therapy has always been here. So I've talked, to, I've talked to past presidents of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, and, and I've said to them, well, according to all the literature, oral appliance compliance is higher than CPAP. Oh, I don't believe that. I was, what do you mean? You're telling me that you don't believe the three decades of peer-reviewed published research? And he said, nope, I don't trust any of my patients. So that's the mindset that we're often encountering. So why is it important to measure it? Because we know that better compliance equals better results, reduced treatment time, particularly when you're dealing with orthodontics, right? If you're using a functional, removable orthodontic device like a Schwartz, and you don't have any compliance, right? Garbage in, garbage out. It's not going to work. Non-compliance is a waste of resources. The insurance payers now will no longer pay for CPAP therapy unless you can demonstrate compliance. The Achilles heel of CPAP is compliance. Mask is a huge issue. That's the number one issue. It's not the size of the blower. It's not the warm passover humidification. It's not the hose. The hoses are often heated now to prevent water. There's two Achilles heels in oral appliance therapy. One is compliance measurement. Another is a priori determination of successful candidates. Now, there are other companies that are looking in using remote control, mandibular repositioning in real time or even in the home now. So that's available. Um, there's science to back that up. It has challenges from a business perspective. We opted to look at this Achilles heel compliance measurement. But the definition of compliance for CPAP traditionally is, was four hours or more a night, five nights a week. But if you ask people on the street and say, how many hours do you need to sleep? Uh, oh, eight. Eight times seven is 56. But four times five is only 20, so that's fuzzy math. So the bar was set really low to have CPAP compliance. Now, however, they, they've changed it more recently because now they require evidence of CPAP compliance and you have to have a, up to a 90-day trial. And the new definition of CPAP compliance is four hours or more a night for 21 nights out of 30 during that initial 90-day trial period. And you have to demonstrate that objectively because the CPAPs all have memory inside them, right? They have USB sticks and they have memory that gets uploaded automatically. In Europe, it's quite different. The definitions vary from country to country. So in France, it's more than three hours a night, seven nights per week. In Germany, it's more than four hours a night. In Italy, it's three. In Spain, it's five. So which definition is more correct? And CPAP machines have the luxury of size. You don't have to worry about limitations because when we're dealing with oral appliances, they go in the body. So we have a limitation on how much size we can actually work with, right? But here, you can put memory cards and all sorts of things. So you've got that luxury um, on CPAP. And here's a CPAP report, where here it says not used, not used, not used. And this gives you 100% usage. You can see naps. And it gives you the time of day over here. Now, the newer CPAP machines will also give you apnea, hypopnea index, because they're measuring airflow off the mask. So you got your AHI, and you got your pressure points. You got your system leak. 
and you have your usage in hours. So let me tell you about our, my, my patient, Juan. Juan is from Colombia. He's a bit of a round individual. He has a Malin Patty score of zero or less. His weight is 1.36 kilos and he has a height of eight inches, giving him a body mass index of 32.5. This is Juan. He's really tired because he's, he's a decaffeinated coffee can. So Juan needs CPAP at 11 centimeters of water pressure. Here's Juan. The CPAP machine is telling me that he uses it uh, every night. And this is the average usage time. It's about between, uh, there's, there's 10 right there, there's five. So he's averaging about seven or eight hours a night. System leak is less than 20. The pressure setting's at 11. This is a real human, by the way, over here. And his AHI is zero because it's working really well for one. Here's the compliance report. You can see not used, not used. And down here, it's telling me that he's using 100% of the time. So gaming CPAP is quite easy. The game, and I mean deceiving a CPAP device, is quite easy. And this is just a quick and dirty demonstration of CPAP. I can add valves to mimic hypopneas and apneas on timers and do all that, but literally that took me minutes because I was just looking at Juan one day sitting across from me and thinking I could probably make an artificial lung circuit out of that in a matter of minutes. A little bit of duct tape, quick pair of scissors, and we had Juan. So the thing about CPAP is you cannot guarantee that it's actually that particular patient wearing that CPAP. All right, so this has implications when we're talking about the transportation sector. You could have the bed partner or a simple device like I just showed you or a more sophisticated device mimic a CPAP circuit and deceive the machine. And this has important implications for what's going to be happening in the future. But I think it's important to assume that people will always, there will always be some people out there who will be motivated to deceive the system. And if we're looking at CPAP compliance, we know that adherence is defined as greater than four hours a night. And when they did that, they found that 46 to 83% of patients were non-adherent to CPAP therapy. So that's a huge number. And that was published uh, in 2008 from Weaver and Grunstein. CPAP intolerance is a, is a very large market for you and your patients. And according to the literature, about half the patients at the end of a year stop using their CPAP. We also know from the literature that if you stop using your CPAP for one night, you're going to lose all of the therapeutic benefit. So it's really important that it's worn every night. A few years ago, the FMCSA, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, published in their Federal Register that there's limited data regarding compliance and long-term efficacy of dental appliances, and this technology is not approved alternative to CPAP at this time. That was withdrawn the same day. It was, it was actually accidentally, mistakenly published. But members of this academy, we went down with Mr. Marty Russo to DC in, the, in July of 2013. And uh, we gave a presentation to the FMCSA to bring them up to speed on oral appliances and objective compliance measurement. So what about oral appliance compliance measurement? According to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine in their 2005 paper, they mentioned that that indirect measure that we talked about earlier is common for oral appliance therapy. In contrast, CPAP compliance is objectively routinely measured, even though I've just shown you the limitations of CPAP compliance measurement. And the development of similar capabilities for oral appliance therapy should be pursued for both research and clinical purposes. And remember, this is that first Achilles heel of oral appliance therapy I mentioned earlier. So we want to level the playing field now between CPAP and oral appliance therapy. That's our goal. So what is oral appliance therapy compliance? It sounds simple, right? We know that CPAP is set at four hours, whether it's 21 nights out of 30 or five out of seven or every night at three hours in France. But when we ask people, well, how do you define oral appliance therapy compliance? So we asked experts in the field and they all kind of scratched their head and said, well, it's when you wear it. Yeah, but how much? So we said, okay, we'll put it at six hours a night. Let's assume most people are sleeping six to eight, and we'll go 50% higher than CPAP because we think in our compliance rates are better than CPAP, so we'll set it at six. But we said, okay, how compliant are you every day? And then we had another colleague who said, well, if I, go, if I have a patient who spent two or $3,000 on their custom-made medical device oral appliance, 
and they go to Mexico on vacation, but they, they fear losing it, what if they intentionally decide not to wear their appliance because they're on vacation? Is that non-compliance? So he said, okay, we'll, we'll add a measure of intent. So now we have another measure of compliance, which means how compliant are you in days where you're actually trying to wear it for at least 15 minutes a day? So that shows intent. And then from the literature, I wanted to add the, true, the two traditional, the traditional measure of, historical measure of CPAP and the new measure, because I think we need to have that data readily available to compare oral appliance therapy compliance versus CPAP. And then more recently, we've had, based on marketplace feedback, we've added two more measures. How compliant are you if you changed appliances? Because sometimes people do change appliances. My dog loves my appliances. I've lost three so far to my dog. So I've changed appliances. I probably have gone through 10 in the last 12 years. How compliant are you since the last time we, we, uh, we looked at the data, since the last time we uploaded the data to the cloud portal? So we've got six measures of compliance, and the goal for compliance has been going on for decades, right? This is back from 1975 in a U.S. patent, and it was a headgear timer, you know, the orthodontic headgear, and they put a timer on here, and they talked about uh, the neckband having a device, and when you put it on, it would activate a timer, and they could count, and you can see here, another one from 1999, the compliance science system. There was research done in Turkey using that device, and what they found is when they started monitoring the patients, they were able to increase compliance because they knew that someone was watching them. But children can be pretty creative, and they used to hook them up to balls and dolls, and so they got around that. So they were able to deceive it rather easily. And then Dr. Alan Lowe and, and colleagues had uh, an original patent that they applied for in 1998. Again, looking at temperature sensing, um, but there's limitations of just measuring temperature. So I'm going to talk about DentiTrack because right now it's the only FDA cleared product uh, that's out there. So I can't talk in generic terms because there's nothing else on the market right now. So what is oral appliance therapy compliance monitoring? Is it a sensor? No, because uh, it has more than just a sensor. It has other components to it. Is it a chip? Well, I usually say no because a chip is something you eat, but everyone still calls it a chip, but that's just the way it is. So is it a micro recorder? Yes. So we usually say it's a micro recorder because this is a recorder that you wear outside your body and it has internal power, internal sensors, internal memory, has a means for communication. Well, guess what? This has the same. This is just a traditional Herbst. And you've got internal power. The power supply will last about five years. The um, memory will fill up after about six months. So every six months you have to upload it to the cloud, go see your dentist twice a year. You have internal sensors for temperature and head position and time and CPUs. And so, in, in the fundamental ways, this, they're, they're both data loggers. And you can embed them inside of an oral appliance in the same methods that you would embed a label today. And so here I'll show you some examples of what they look, at, look like. Um, this is inside of, a, of a, a G2. And this is inside of a traditional dorsal fin from Salomed. Uh, this is a dream tap. Um, this is Suad Ultra Elite, I think it was called, it was an earlier version. They're now, I think, manufactured by Somnomed. Um, again, traditional Herbst. Uh, this was a Moses appliance, that was mine. And um, that's a, a view from the rear, side view. And this is an Oasis. So you can put them in virtually any um, acrylic device. The data is uploaded through a base station, uses infrared light. Now, here, there's IR infrared emitters. It's like your TV remote control. So when you put it in the base station, it has to be positioned to communicate with the IR. And uh, your auxiliary would do much of this. And they would upload the data to the cloud. And there's an account for the patient in the cloud. And again, this is just changing in technology. This is the future I'm talking about. We've actually had some interesting experiences where, when we've been working with clinicians. So we've actually had to kind of take a step back and reevaluate how we're working with people in the marketplace. And we're going to be restricting um, kind of the reintroduction to specific dental labs and specific clinicians because some of the dental offices, um, for example, they would call up our tech support people and then say, hey, it's not working. And then we found out, well, 
it's not our equipment and it's, it's your computer is locked down so tight that you don't have any portals, any ports open from your computer to talk to the computer in the cloud. So there's communication issues. There's sometimes I, I had received a denti track recently from a friend who put it in backwards. And say, well, there's your problem. You're putting it in backwards. It's not going to communicate. If I have the TV remote control, if that's my TV and I have the remote control, I don't aim the remote control out the window. I aim it at the TV. So you're not going to get communication if you're pointing it in the wrong direction. So there's things like that. And so we're going to be kind of taking a step back to reevaluate how we introduce it because we want to make sure that it's a smooth introduction into the marketplace, working with, with uh, key uh, luminaries and opinion leaders. And all of this, again, is done in the cloud. And you upload it, and then you get the data. And this is the raw data. It doesn't really mean anything to you. This is before it's plotted. And when it's plotted, we have uh, sophisticated anti-deception algorithms that then give you percent supine, non-supine head position. There's a nap. When you put it in, when you take it out, uh, hours of daily use, and above or below prescribed wearing time. And these are some of the different definitions I mentioned earlier, every day the 15 minutes or more, the traditional historical CPAP, and you know how high the measures are on the CPAP measures. This is a traditional CPAP um, report for compliance, and this is the oral appliance report for compliance. Here's a daily, we set the, the dashed line represents six hours of daily use. For my son Schwartz, we had him up at 22 hours, so the dashed line was way up here. And so you hear I was in Africa at that time and I didn't know where I was. I ended up in some place. So I didn't bring it with me because I didn't want to lose my oral appliance. So I used a temporary appliance. So that's why there's no data here because that was intentional. And um, you can see that most nights I'm well above. This is one of my employees and he was at 100%. And then I was thankful that one day he dropped below. So we actually got it down to 99 because otherwise nobody would believe it. So um, this is a CPAP graph showing daily use. You saw something similar earlier. This is ramp time, uh, centimeters of water pressure, uh, humidity level, and hours of daily use. And this is, we, we kind of follow the same CPAP paradigm because we're not going to reinvent the wheel. So on those six measures of compliance earlier, 78% compliant every day at six hours or more. 81% if I'm wearing it for 15 minutes or more a day if my intent to wear it. And uh, if I'm using the two CPAP definitions, you know, so high it is at 100% because the CPAP bar is much lower at four hours, right? Overall, 78%, that's if I'm using multiple appliances and since my last upload. So Van Der Veeken, this is a professor from uh, University of Antwerp. He published an article in Thorax in, the, in medical literature in 2013. Talked about objective compliance measurement, compared objective and subjective and he introduced a term called mean disease alleviation. I alluded to it earlier. So he says objective oral appliance therapy compliance measurement allows this calculation of mean disease alleviation defined as combined function of efficacy and compliance. So effectiveness equals compliance, which is time times efficacy, which is used as a percentage reduction of AHI. So for example, oral appliance efficacy here was 56%. Mean disease alleviation, you wear it for 91% of the time, but you're reducing your AHI by 56%. Gives you an overall mean disease alleviation of 51%. And this is from the paper he published. And you can see here what he's talking about. Mean disease alleviation, 56% reduction in AHI, but you're wearing it 91% of the time. And so overall, you're reducing the disease by about 51%. So if I'm using CPAP, for example, and we said earlier that CPAP lowers your AHI much better, and let's say we get a, a reduction in AHI from 50 to 2, right? So we're looking at a 96% reduction in AHI, but the patient only wears it half the, half the night. You'll, you'll see that a lot. The patient will take it off and say, ah, I'm only wearing this half the night because then I get my real sleep. So if they're wearing it 50% of the night, and even if you're reducing it 96%, your overall mean disease alleviation is 48%. So this goes back to what others said, right? Like what Philip said. We know that there's higher compliance with oral appliance therapy, and there's similar adjusted effect in this when we compare it to CPAP. We know oral appliance therapy is not as good as CPAP in reducing AHI values, 
but the mean disease alleviation values might be comparable to CPAP because of the higher compliance with oral appliance therapy. And Phillips said the same thing. And if we go back to Chan and Sestouli, they said the same thing, you know, four years earlier. Well, they're talking about this is great on CPAP, but this is not so good. And when we compare the two, they're about the same. So keep that in mind when you're talking to people, or you're talking to sleep physicians or sleep technologists about CPAP. Are you better off wearing something that really reduces your HI but you don't wear it much? Or wearing something a lot but it doesn't quite work as well? And the research from the medical literature is telling us it's about the same overall. So more research on using objective appliance compliance measurements. 51 patients with mild to moderate OSA and they found that neither anthropomorphic, uh, anthropometric, excuse me, and polysomnographic parameters nor reports of EDS correlated with oral appliance compliance. The two parameters which correlated with oral appliance compliance, higher values of it, were decreased snoring and dry mouth. I can explain decreased snoring, probably the bed partner is giving them positive reinforcement. And when they're talking now about CPAP compliance, there's a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy being used and getting social input from family members to reinforce the positive benefits of CPAP to improve CPAP compliance. This is from 2015 in the Journal of Dental Sleep Medicine, combination therapy of OSA in order to achieve complete disease alleviation from taboo to new standard of care. So here, Professor Van Der Veeken makes the case uh, for CPAP and oral appliance therapy that they have limitations, but when you combine the two, you can often get better results. Whether you're combining oral appliance therapy with CPAP, right, to reduce CPAP pressure, or uh, you're combining oral appliance therapy with positional therapy, or CPAP therapy with positional therapy, basically they're saying that you can get uh, a vast improvement in mean disease alleviation through combination. And he says, this is not imaginary, and the results in a similar overall effectiveness for both therapeutic modalities between CPAP and oral appliance therapy. Now here's an article that was published by Dort and Remmers in the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine 2012 and what they found was that when they combined uh, a tongue retaining device bulb with traditional mandibular advancement they also had a better improvement in, in AHI. And Van Der Veeken makes the case for combination therapy even oral appliance therapy with multi-level upper airway surgery oral appliance therapy with positional treatment combined, he says the mean disease alleviation will improve from 42% to 70%. That's quite profound. So keep all of that in mind. So can we game oral appliance therapy the same way that we can game CPAP? Can we trick it? Well, it's a lot harder to deceive your oral appliance therapy, right? Because I can't give my oral appliance to my spouse, my bed partner. It won't fit them. If I give it to my dog, my dog's gonna love it as a chew toy. Juan is not a substitute, right? Because I can't hook Juan up to my oral appliance. And what about a heated water bath? A lot of people will say, well, what if I put it in an aquarium or put it in a warm water bath? Can I deceive the oral appliance technology, the compliance technology? So this is a Buki water bath. It's a high-end bath that's used to maintain constant pressure, very precise. It's used for like a chemical laboratory. And so, the study published in the Journal of Oral Facial Orthopedics in 2010, they did this with a different device and they had a, a paradigm where they had it turning off and on at preset times and they found that if you're using just a simple temperature device, yes, you can deceive it. However, with the DentiTrack, we've added more than just temperature and we added anti-deception algorithms so we replicated their experiment and we were able to pass it. So you cannot deceive that technology because we're doing more than just um, we we're doing more than just temperature. So to conclude, um, we're entering exciting times for oral appliance therapy. You know, we've seen change in technology. We're going to see continued growth, continued uptake. Oral appliance treatment compliance measurement is a rapidly expanding frontier, particularly when we're talking about um, <coughs> transportation sector. Truck drivers, airline pilots. We've been talking to the FMCSA. Uh, members of this academy went to uh, Capitol Hill to give presentations. Um, it took a lot of effort from our chief technology officer, Don Bradley, to design this technology. It's, it's a lot more challenging than anything else we've ever done. We've, we've probably spent six years doing this and uh, we're still enhancing it. Um, there's new standards evolving. 
So just like today, we have compliance as a standard parameter, a standard measure of CPAP. The objective compliance is in all CPAPs. In the future, I think we're going to see a lot more uptake of objective compliance measurement for treating sleep obstructive sleep apnea. And it's going to be a requirement from insurance companies because we're not going to reinvent the wheel. The paradigm's already there. We're just going to kind of reinforce that paradigm. So new standards are going to evolve. We've modeled much of it after the existing paradigm. And when you're looking at the overall process of test, treat, track, keep all of that in mind that I discussed. And where do you go from here? Um, Principles and Practice of Sleep Medicine is a great book. I mentioned that earlier. Um, sleep Medicine for Dentists, that's uh, the senior uh, editors, Dr. Gilles Levine, Dr. Peter Sestouli I mentioned earlier, and Dr. Smith. And um, the ASBA has a diplomat exam, and I mentioned the free app earlier. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and if there's any questions, we can take some time now before we break for lunch.